Yes. So I promised you uh, the second half of the proof of the terms is there. But you have to put a, you have to embed a disk, you have to embed an envelope, an SN, so that the boundary lies inside the annulus, not the end, inside the Anyway, but I'm not going to do that today. So uh, I'm still thinking about it, trying to see the right way to do it. So instead, I'm going to go ahead with the uh, tourist trip, which you saw the first day rather hurriedly. Uh, so let me do that more carefully. So uh, there's going to be a diagram. I'll put it here, which takes the length of the blackboard. And it starts at the bottom with a homeomorphism of R n. H is a homeomorphism. And we would like to, well, as I said before, we, if it's just a homeomorphism, uh, in the old days, we didn't know what to do with it. You couldn't get your hands on it uh, if it was differentiable at a point. In other words, if it was in the sense of differentiability. If it was approximated by a linear map at a point, then you can sort of expand that and isotop the, isotop the homeomorphism to the identity. So in particular, if you had a homeomorphism, what would you want to do with it? Well, one of the things you might want to do if it's homeomorphism or it is isotopic to the identity. But there's no way to get your hands on the homeomorphism to do that uh, up, till, uh, well, up till 1968. So, uh, the Torres trick is a way to is a way to do that. So what we want to do is turn this homeomorphism into a periodic homeomorphism. So this is a homeomorphism which is just does whatever it does to Arya. We'd like to take a small piece of it and then extend in a way that sort of replicates that small piece over and over again, so that it's bounded out of infinity. That's that's the idea. So in order to do that, uh, you know, the, the prototype for this is, is that if you have a homeomorphism of a torus, this is the M torus, if you have a homeomorphism of this, it moves stuff around. But then when you lift to the universal cover, so this is just a lattice that maps up down here. If this is uh, e to the 2 pi i x. That's basically the map. Then uh, it, this is the integer lattice, uh, 0, 1, 2, etc. You know, the integer lattice. And then each one of these squares or n cubes maps onto this. And so then whatever this does is replicated by some, assuming this is homotopic to the identity, this square would go to something like this, and then it will do the same thing everywhere. It's not homotopic to the identity. Here, here I'm sort of fixing the lattice points as though, as though that point was, you know, the homeomorphism to fix that point. So in that case, it looks like this everywhere. Uh, same thing on the, on the sides, whatever they do. Uh, and so then you get something which kind of replicates a piece of this at least over and over again, and you get a bounded homeomorphism of Arya. So that's that's why the torus comes into it because of because of this idea. So, the question, but that's starting with a homeomorphism of the torus. You don't start with a homeomorphism of the torus. Then what? Well, you want to turn this homeomorphism of Arian into a homeomorphism of the torus somehow. So uh, you start with that. So then we, we choose an immersion of the m torus minus well, a big disk, dn, 2 dn. And another version over here, it's the same one, except here you remove something bigger, here we remove something smaller. Just a disk of radius. I mean, two somehow means twice as big a disk. So these immersions, uh, so first of all, uh, there's this inversion, alpha, uh, puncture torus minus point, uh, into Rn. Well, you can, 
you can construct it. Uh, that's possible to do. Or you can use the theorem, which is this nice general theorem of uh, um, a snail, uh, or her snail and hers, uh, which says that if you have a bun this is this is open, so it's important that there's not a top dimensional handle. And so this is an open n dimensional manifold, and you can map it into Rn if there's a bundle map. In other words, this the bundle map should be the if, if you did have this smooth version, this is actually smooth, then its differential would give you a bundle map between the tangent bundle of one and the tangent bundle of the other. Well, both tangent bundles are trivial. So it's just a, it's just a, it's just the differential, then it's just a, a uh, linear epimorphism. Um, on two, I mean it's, so Smale's theorem says that if you have the bundle map, then you can get the inversion. And so of course we have a bundle map because the bundles are both trivial. And so uh, it's, just, it's just trivial to construct one. You can take the constant, you can take the map of the whole manifold to a point, and then that extends to the trivial bundle over the manifold, to the trivial bundle over that point. So you've got a bundle map. And then Smale's and Hirsch's theorem, uh, theorem, the theory says that that map, the constant map, can be homotopped to one which, whose differential, uh, to an inversion, whose differential is, is uh, uh, well, home, well, the differential is essentially the one given. So that's a general theorem that would give you this. Um, It's, it's, not, it's not too hard. Um, so anyway, we've got this immersion, one way or another. Construct it or use that theorem. So now we've got this homeomorphism, and we'd like to find a homeomorphism or an embedding here. We want to find such an embedding. Now, then there were quite a ways towards finding a homeomorphism of the toruses, which is what we're after. Well, so how do we do that? Well, if this homeomorphism pushes stuff all over the place, you know, it's not going to take the image of this, it's not going to take this immersed torus anywhere close to this immersed torus. However, if this is small, so we assume, so assume uh, H, is small enough on a compact set containing uh, alpha of, let's say the bigger one, alpha pn minus dn. So small enough on a compact set containing that. So that um, so that H takes alpha of Tn minus 2dn inside alpha of Tn minus dn. So I'm, I'm going to draw this for you. Illustrating the disks, so we have a we have a little uh, log, funny shaped torus like this. But up above, we see these disks with more clarity. So here's there are the two disks. So this is this is uh, two. That one's twice as big as this one. They're the two discs, they're sort of the top handles of the torus. Now this gets, so um, this gets immersed. If you take those away, it gets immersed. And so then when you move, when you move the image of this one, it gets wiggled a little bit. So it basically gets wiggled, you know, it'll go something like this. That's where that'll be, this will be the image of H of, of uh, 
alpha of 2D of the boundary. That's what I do that. So you see it just wiggles a little bit. So, so, that, that's, so that this is true. In other words, you take it. So actually, this is immersed. So I mean, that's not quite the right picture. You, you, I mean, let's see. So if I draw this picture, I do this the other way previous time. And so that's the image of, this is alpha of the m torus minus uh, the bigger disk, the uh, smaller one. And then the smaller one, remember we took out more, that sits inside. etc. like that. Now, so what I've drawn here, these two, these pair, if you go back to the torus, they look like the round ones. And after all, the boundary of this is a circle, and it's the same circle as here. And so what I'm saying in, in this picture is that when you, uh, when H moves something, it doesn't move it very much. This, this guy will wiggle a little bit, but it won't go outside, it won't go outside the image of alpha. So this is, this is, this arc right here is alpha of the boundary of Tn minus 2 d. So I don't want it to move too much. Is that, I, I guess that's going to be clear right now. I'm probably belaboring it too much. So, so that this is true. Then we can lift H to an embedding like this, uh, H prime for some given any name. And that will be this now. So we lift it. So we lift it to that main. Now, so far there's been no choices. Because this is supposed to be, this construction is supposed to vary continuously as we, if we vary each. And so there's no there's no choices yet. I mean, we we, we fix alpha once and for all. No matter what h is, we fix alpha, and then choose h to be small enough so that this condition holds. So that's going to give us a neighborhood of the identity. So, all right. So we got h prime, and now we can put the disks back in. Torus, the torus. And now we'd like to get a map across there. Well, that's where the Schoenface theorem comes in, because this is basically, this isn't a sphere, but this is a, a co-dimension one sphere, an M minus one sphere embedded in a coordinate chart, which is the top handle. So it's a, it's a so it's, it's, it's not quite the Schoenface theorem, but it's, it's, it works fine. And so then in the Schoenface theorem, remember that uh, you had to find, there's two steps to the Schoenfeld theorem. One of them I haven't shown you yet, which is how you find a, a disk. So remember the Schoenfeld theorem. We have a sphere, and then we embedded, this is the way I tend to draw it. This was, uh, this is a, an F of an S, N minus 1 cross minus one one. That's what this strip is. And it goes around the back. And then it has two closed components, A and B. And we showed that both the, the F restricted to the SN minus one cross zero extends to a homeomorphism of the whole sphere. Or, or in other words, the inside of the wall. Well, to show that there was two steps to that, and one of them I've shown you already, and one of them was if you can find, if you can, if you can embed 
uh, an involve so that the boundary of that involve lies in the strip. Uh, this, this is the strip. So it's n minus 1 squared cross i. It lies in there. Then we did the cellularity construction. In other words, if you could put it in there, you know, it might look. But if the boundary's in there, then we just shrink. We do that cellularity construction in order to prove it. So you see the cellularity part. And that's all that's all that's needed here because we don't over there you you had to work to, to, to find this. But here it's just handed to us. And where is it? Well, this is our wiggly sphere. We want it to bound a ball on top so that we can extend we can extend H prime over this missing disk. So and there it is, and so uh, all we need to, do to observe is that if we take, if we look at a disk of radius three, a bigger disk. So these, the, the one, two, and three are all chosen inside this top handle of the end of the end course. So then here's a here's a disk which which is bounds on the outside on the top, and then that tells us that. We can, we can, uh, that's the thing. Now we use cellularity, that argument, to just show that this guy bounds the ball on this side. In other words, this is our, the sure face here, and this is our f of sn minus 1 cross i, because it's certainly got a collar neighborhood. It's that, and it bounds the ball on this side. Well, that's what we need. So this, this bounds the ball on this side, and obviously does on that side, and so then you extend by uh, just using the ball in the uh, obvious only work. So you end up pulling this in to, to the North Pole here, and it gets pulled in, and you get it just gets shrunk in like this, and it ends up bounding the ball. And so now when you extend, what is this extension? So you have h bar. What is that extension? Well, where does it take a point that's inside the ball of radius 2n? Well, this bounds the ball, so there's a ray. So this point would just go to the, uh, well, here's the boundary of dn. And so you take this interval and the straight interval. It's just it's just a radial extension. Okay, so we're here. Now then, uh, as I said before, we can take the exponential map, whatever you call it, lift this to, to E. <coughs> it's a lift this, maybe I should call this now uh, say capital E. And this is bound just by this picture. It's bound. We know that this the map was homotopic to the identity because it was small. This was a small homeomorphism, so it's currently close to the identity, close enough that it doesn't do any twisting around big circles. So this is bounded when you lift it, and that's and therefore. By the Alexander isotopy, it's isotopic to the identity. So the question now is, well, it's isotopic to the identity, but how is it related to the homeomorphism we began with? Well, you know, if you think about what the homeomorphism did uh, say at the zero handle of this. The zero handle is way down here at the bottom. Let me make that over here. So there's a zero handle down here at the bottom. And that zero handle basically hasn't been touched. It was, here it was, uh, well, the, this was, immer you, can, you can choose your immersion. So I guess maybe the next step is we lift it to H prime, ex extend, 
by a version of the shell face then. Now notice that we could have chosen uh, alpha. We want to go back and note that we would like to choose. We could have chosen alpha and coordinates so that, well, if you think of this. Uh, Take, take a little neighborhood around around zero and suppose that goes to the zero handle. So I guess that's down here. So that neighborhood goes there. Just, just a small zero handle at the bottom of this big torus. Well in that case we can sort of identify that zero handle that's a long way away from this disk, so the zero handle's here, and it's here, and then it just goes right back up by E to where it started from. So that zero handle we'll call BN, this is really this zero handle. And it really goes there, and there, and there, and there, and all these diagrams commute. And then the same thing is true on the other side. Now because this is a little bit of a wiggle, you actually need a slightly bigger zero handle. So if we put in here twice that, so this is a, a bigger zero handle. Oh, I suppose we could have started with that one and cut this down smaller. But anyway, it's a bigger one so that we have the same commutative diagram over here. choices here except for this extension using the Schirm face there. H was given, alpha is fixed once and for all. Well alpha is fixed and then nature is chosen small enough. This is just uh, this is no choices here. Come on, well the, the Schirm face theorem there's a choice and there's this is just the exponential. There's no choices other than in the Schirm face theorem and that's why we need the Schirm face theorem to have a canonical version which I didn't really go through, but I did say that when we, when we were doing the solidarity part, that the choices you make when you find these, these nested sequence of balls to shrink, you can make those choices continuously varying because all you were doing was picking uh, you know, half of the maximum radius. You were just doing a few elementary calculations of that. So this is all, this is all uh, canonical, which means that uh, which means that uh, this varies continuously over homeomorphisms in a small neighborhood of the identity. So that was I going to say, so that uh, the diagram with the zero handles bn and 2bn commutes. 
Well, now all we want to do is isotop. Use, and the whole purpose of this was to get capital H to be bounded. So now you use the Alexander isotopy, which gives you an isotopy of H to the identity. H bounded implies by Alexander that a, a capital H is isotopic to the identity. So by a H naught, H T, comma, H naught equal to H, H one. So if that's isotopic to the identity, then what's happening for little h? Well, that isotopy, so capital H equals little h on this in, on this end wall. So if you just run that isotopy to the identity, then it's going to carry little h to the identity on, on this end wall. That's where it'll carry it to the identity. Uh, it'll be something or other elsewhere. But then once it's the identity on the end wall, then you just use the Alexander isotopy going out to push the identity out. And you get it to be the identity everywhere. So, uh, to make that more precise, So H is isotopic in the identity. Um, this is an isotopy of little h. This is an isotopy of uh, little h to a homomorphism to the identity on the other one. Because after all, capital H and little h agreed there. Uh, then, then, actually, this is often all we want for, for many purposes, but. Uh, it's isotopic to the identity on the end wall. Well, then, if it's, you know, as I said, you then just expand it out. So then, just push, push the wiggly part further and further out until it's gone in infinity. Push it off to infinity. So, therefore, all the morphisms of R M, let's say, fixing the identity, they're fixing the origin. I guess that's not really necessary. Uh, it is locally contractible. And we took a small neighborhood of the identity here and isotopic, isotopic the identity of well, the whole neighborhood. We deformed the identity. Now, that just says that, that, that the, it's locally contractible at the identity. But to get it to be locally tractable somewhere else, uh, if, you pick a, if you pick a different homeomorphism in the neighborhood of it, then precompose that whole thing with the, with the homeomorphism, and then it becomes a neighborhood of the identity. You do this, and then you go back. So, so it's locally contractible. Okay. Questions? Yes. So this is obviously the central result of what I think. Could you explain why it's so central? I, I know some of the answers, but somehow for people who have not followed, I mean, okay, well, there's this low, how does it affect, if you take an arbitrary homeomorphism, for example, how does it... Uh, I haven't, I, no, this is not deal yet. Not yet. So there's another version of the torus mm, Yeah. where this might be large. Mm -hmm. And then... Well, it's, it's the same idea, but a little different. Yeah. And so I have to get to so that. That tells you how to take an arbitrary homeomorphism mm -hmm. and isotop it to the identity. 
what I'm really asking is for people who are not experts, who yeah. know that this is obviously a very important result, why is it so important? You have to, I know it's Well, <laughs> so first, so, I mean, the fact that this is locally contractible. Yes. Uh, but that's, that's how, well, you're, you're going to see that this, this tells you that the homeomorphisms of a metal, th this idea tells you, is going to tell you later in this hour that the homeomorphisms of a manifold okay. are locally contractible. So that's based on homeomorphism. This is already known in the smooth case mm -hmm. uh, using the C infinity topology. Mm -hmm. That's the typical way to yeah. do it. So it was known there. Uh, the PL case, if, well, the PL case is always funny, and I'll sort of get back to that later. The reason being that you don't have a natural topology on the space of PL homeomorphisms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I'll say this now, and I'll say it later. That the 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 uh, the space of diffeomorphisms has a in a sense it's an infinite-dimensional object, but it still has a notion of how to map a smooth arc, how to map an arc smoothly into that space. Mm -hmm. In other words, a one-parameter family of uh, of diffeomorphisms you can talk about it varying smoothly with respect to the parameter. But this, the, uh, the space of PL homeomorphisms of Aryan does not have a natural PL structure to it. You don't know right off how to, what it means to map a, a simplicial complex into that space and have the map be piecewise linear or simplicial. And so you have to go to semi-simplicial complexes, and, which works, but it's, it's a nuisance. <laughs> On the other hand, in the topological case, uh, you do know you have the space of homeomorphisms, we know what, this has a topology, the, com, the compact open topology. And so we know what it means in this category, which is just a category of continuous things. We know what it means to map the, uh, an arc or, or a space continuously into here. We know that. So, so the, in that sense, top and different are the same. They have space of, of homeomorphisms uh, has a topology, which is all you want. The space of diffeomorphisms has a smooth structure in a certain sense. It's not a finite dimensional manifold, but it still sort of has a smooth structure. Whereas the space of PL homeomorphisms doesn't naturally have a PL structure. So anyway, why do you want to have local contractibility yeah. in each of these three categories? And that was kind of your question. Yes. Uh, well, it tells you, so it tells you several things. Uh, for one thing, it tells you that if you're, that there are only a countable number of compact manifolds uh, in a given dimension. That's true in the smooth case by Cheeger, proved in the topological case by Keister as soon as we had local contractibility. So I'll, Um, I should, I'll wave my hands at a proof of that right now, I guess. Mm -hmm. So if you have, you have local contractibility for, for just uh, manifolds, which I'll get to, you have local contractibility, then why would you imagine that there's just a, a countable number of compact manifolds of a given dimension? So the manifolds can be covered by charts. A given manifold can be covered by charts. So take the, I guess, the minimal number of charts required to cover a given manifold. That's a finite number. So we're going to, we're, all we're going to do is look at the number of manifolds that can be covered by k charts. And then if that's countable, then it will be for each k and you're done. So it's covered by k charts. Well, now, if there was an uncountable number covered by k charts, you'd have a, an accumulation point where two of them would have charts which are very close to each other. So one of them has charts overlapping this way, and the other one has charts overlapping just a little bit different. Just a little bit different. Now you use local contractibility to say, oh, I can move the second manifold's charts to overlap the same way as the first, and then they're the same manifold. That's the idea. Uh, these local contractibility. So it sort of says that if you're going to cover your manifold with k charts, and if you're going to have an uncountable number of them, then there's going to be 
there's going to be two of them where the charts are very close. And if they're close enough, then you can move the charts to degree, mm -hmm. and that's it. So that, that's Is one. That one of Kister's papers. That's one of Kister's papers. Uh, might be with Cheeger. Anyway, uh, Cheeger did it in the smooth case. Yeah. And then Kister, that was basically his argument, Kister did it in the topological case. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, I mean, I don't know what you do with that result, but it's kind of appealing that there's only a countable number in any dimension. Mm -hmm. It's a good, good result. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the isotopy extension theorem. Yes. Like the but that's theorem, a technical. That's that, that statement, the classification statement, is very good, of course. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have another question. Sure. Can you kind of give us a hint how this will apply to the triangulation? Because, I mean, so far you've spoken about the differential yeah. category and the, the topological category, but now we're going to kind of compare two categories, the PL and the top, and this is again a fairly well, central. So there's a preview of what you presumably well, talked about. Uh, yeah. I mean, oh yes, I know one place it's going to apply. Uh, you'll see this later, but let me just give you a hint now. Suppose that you wanted to, suppose you have walls to, which says that there's more than one PL structure on an interval cross an end torus. Which, sorry, the, 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 so let me write a little bit of this. Thank you. Uh, suppose that you have, so this is getting ahead of it, but just kind of see where we're going. So a wall says that uh, I cross the end torus has PL structures structures uh, corresponding to the third homology of I plus TM L boundary using two coefficients. So there's the third homology here, obviously. It's real boundary and the Z2 coefficients same Z2 as the R invariant. You'll, you'll see that connection later on. So it has PL structures corresponding to this. Now then, suppose yeah, okay. so now uh, corresponding is real boundary. So this is this is standard on a boundary. It's PL standard on the boundary. In other words, 0 and 1 cross T on the boundary. And uh, just by standard, I just mean that this, this, uh, this PL, there's a PL structure on here, so some PL manifold, but it's the standard TN of both ends. That's what that means. So now then, this is, so I, and I'm going to write, put down uh, sigma here to denote a uh, sum or an exotic PL structure. So take one, take one of the exotic ones that exist, take one of these non-zero elements. So that's just a strange PL structure on here that's standard of the two ones. Now then, this is an S coordinate. So I cross TN sigma is PL on the worker to I cross TN. Sounds like a contradiction, but the PL only morphism does not can't can't fix both ends. So it's homeomorphic, fixing um, zero cross Tn, but not 
on one cost to him. Because if we fix both of them, then, then this would be then this would be standard. It would be the zero element here. So the whole problem is, is this other end. It doesn't fix it. Okay. Well, uh, fix this in, which means that uh, there's, there was sort of, so to speak, an identity. It was, we were, this, this, when we say rail boundary, it's sort of, that fixes the boundary, but here it's, it's, a, it's different. So there's a diffeomorphism, I mean a PL homeomorphism from uh, PL homeomorphism to this. So we have one cross TN is taken by some automorphism to here. I mean, I, my notation isn't good. Something is moved at the at the one at the one end. There's a, there's a there's a PL automorphism there at the one end because we couldn't we couldn't fix it, so it moved to somewhere else, and it's that PL homeomorphism I'm talking about. Now I'll take a large enough. Odd cover so that the PL homomorphism on one cross TN. That's the one I was just talking about. I haven't given you a name of it. So that PL homomorphism on that end is small in the compact open topology on the end on the homeomorphisms to the end. So why is it small? Well, so that's something you have to think about a little bit. Uh, if you take if you take a homeomorphism of the circle that rotates by two theta and you, and you lift it by the double cover, it only rotates by theta. And that should be plausible to you because, you know, if you think of the double map, this maps this circle twice around this one. So, so angles have to double. Well, then if you take a, a, a thing on the circle down here and lift it up, angles have to get halved. Well, that's the idea behind saying that this is going to be small. If you take a large enough cover, then it's going to be small just by that argument, expanded over the intors. I took an odd cover because this Z2 obstruction won't vanish. I took an even cover, it might put a zero. So I took an odd cover. So it's odd. It's odd. This is so that. The exoticity of sigma remains. So we still have, we've taken this odd cover, and now we have a different sigma, but it's still exotic, might be different. Uh, but now this, this discrepancy on the end is small. So by local contractibility, here's the punchline. By topological local contractibility, um, this <coughs> PL homeomorphism cover of it, because we took a big odd cover. Oh, so the PL homeomorphism is small. No, it didn't look good. PL homeomorphism is isotopic to the identity. But what that basically means is that this, that this, is, that this manifold is uh, 
is that there, there was a, that there's a homeomorphism of this pair to the standard pair, but not a PL homeomorphism. In other words, this was, this was we took a non-zero element here, which meant that the PL structure rail boundary was exotic. That means that there is no PL homeomorphism of this pair to the standard pair. But now we've constructed a homeomorphism to that pair. Well, why is that a, a big deal? Well, it says that it says that there must be there must be a handle inside inside here which cannot be isotope to a PL handle. So, in other words, there's a homeomorphism. We've constructed a homeomorphism on this thing, rel boundary, which is not isotopic to a PL homeomorphism, rel boundary, because there isn't a PL homeomorphism. So it can't be isotopic to the one, because there isn't one. But uh, it's isotopic. You know, so it's just, so it's just a, that PL homeomorphism. Now, suppose that you could start wiggling this homeomorphism and move it to a PL homeomorphism. Well, you can't. So where do you get stuck? Well, it might be that on the zero handle, you can't even move the zero handle to a PL handle. Well, you're going to see that you can. But the place you get struck, stuck on is three handles. Mm -hmm. And so that's, this is the argument. Once you know Wall's theorem, this is the argument that there is really a difference between top and PL. And this is this the corollary of this is that I three the top mod PL is well this says it's not zero and in fact it's equal to Z mod two. Now what I told you here doesn't say it's pi three. It just says there's some K handle, but but for later stuff we'll find out it's dimension three. And once again, it's this often very this what we do once again. So all I've used here is what we what we haven't yet proved local contractibility for the mTORs. Mm -hmm. But you've seen it for RN, and it's going to be the same idea. And then we play the hard theorem of wall. There's lots of non simply connected surgery. Uh, but this argument is is uh, very simple. If you you know you have to think. To digest it, but it's, there's nothing very complicated there. Mm. Thank so you. So there's another application of local contractibility. Yeah. It's enough applications to be getting on with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're convinced you should keep listening now. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. There's, a, there's a story, but this yes, uh, in March of 1969, uh, actually, a bunch of us had gone skiing at Lake Tahoe and uh, Larry has allergies, and he was sleeping in the basement where there was no rugs. And then we realized we weren't seeing him during the day when we were skiing. And it turned out he was holed up in the basement uh, working hard on him. And then he mailed, emailed me, he didn't email me in those days, he, he sent me a letter a week later or something uh, with a complicated sketch of this fact. And while trying to read it, trying to understand it, it suddenly occurred to me there was this very simple argument. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what's happened. I don't think I have Larry's letter anymore. It would be too bad. But anyway, this is, this is where it came from. And it came from, uh, I mean, he found the example. And uh, it, it somehow took me off to think about it this way. So that's why we're, this is the reason why we're doing uh, local contractibility. So now, let's see. So now what I want to do is prove local contractibility for homeomorphisms of UK cross RN rail boundary. So I'm basically, what was done here, I didn't ever said zero handle. I'm assuming you all know what, something about handle body theory. But anyway, this was a zero handle case. This is really a point B naught to point cross RN. Forget the point. And now we want to do the same argument for homeomorphisms of BK cross RN, which are the identity on the boundary. So, 
Morphisms of BK cross RN to BK cross RN uh, equal the identity on a neighborhood of boundary BK cross RN torus. Actually, I don't need the neighborhood. on the boundary. If you take a homeomorphism of this, which is small enough, and we're going to go through the same picture and get the you know, same argument. And this didn't, this didn't occur to me immediately. Uh, partly because there's one, there's one feature that, one feature that, uh, well, let's see, I should come back to this. You've been going, well, I started a little late. Let's see. So the, the point here is, Is that we simply, this is a terrible thing to do to your notes, but we simply cross with BK. So we just cross with BK everywhere. And minus K. Don't you want N minus K? BK cross B N minus K. No. No, you don't want Oh, really? No, well, I, oh, I see. It's what I wrote up there, I, 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 see, okay. I have to do the entry. Sorry. Either, either way. <laughs> So we cross with everything, everywhere, everywhere you cross with BK. Everywhere. I'll stop writing. And so notice that this just comes along as there's just no issue about this extra BK. You still have the same aversion. It's, it's a trivial, it's just the, the identity on the BK part. Um, <coughs> basically everything is the same. And this is still bounded. It's bounded. It's bounded in the Rn direction because you're lifting a homeomorphism in the torus. And it has to be bounded in the BK direction because there isn't much room. That stays the same up and down. However, when you want to show this isotopic to the identity, the last part where you use boundedness, uh, so. To show blackboard technique is not good today. Uh, I'm just a little bit of to say something briefly. Uh, so now we have. cross Rn to BK cross Rn by H, this is bounded. Well, what we want to do is stick this inside Rk plus N, and this is inside Rk plus, uh, yeah, Rk plus N. And extend H By the identity, which we can do because remember it's the identity and the boundary of BK. That 
see that? No. I should have said that. Yeah, I did. Equal the identity and the boundary. So you can stand by the identity and now we used is the Alexander isotopy again. And just observe, observe that it, everything outside where it was the identity stays the identity. Because if it was the, the part outside is no problem because here you are, it's, it's bounded here, it's identity out here. And when you push out, if a point out here, it just gets pushed out, moved by identity, and pushed back. So it just remains the identity out there. But this, this part, um, it sort of bends in the end. Anyway, it, it gives you something which is, uh, which is an isotopy. And that's basically all you have to say. It just sort of trivially extends to the case of key handles. Well, then I, so next time I should say, just how it is that you go from the case of handles to manifolds, although you probably are almost willing to believe that. It's, it's sort of a standard argument, but I should give a standard argument once. Also, we want to see how to do it topologically. Uh, yes. Oh, well, yeah. So <laughs> we don't know that. I'm, so this, you can sort of believe it for any topological manifold, which is known to be a handle. Yeah. But, exactly. And that's not known. I mean, in fact, there are four manifolds which are not handle ones. <laughs> but this is true anyway. So I'll, I'll come back and say, say something about that on Wednesday and go on from there. Thank you. Thank you.